Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, today we have Professor Patanjali Kambampati uh, from, the, uh, from McGill University. Um, Pat does a whole lot of uh, di different sorts of work, uh, mainly looking at laser spectroscopy um, of a number of different materials. Um, he develops new techniques um, and he also does something that's quite close to my heart, which is bringing uh, different fields together. So he tries to bridge some of the uh, fields like chemistry and physics together where we talk about phonons versus vibrational modes or, or things like that. So um, without further ado, uh, Pat, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Murad. Thank you everyone for being here. It's a pleasure to be in Australia for the first time and, uh, and I'm, ha I'm happy to show you about some of the things we've been doing in the last few years where uh, we will present about this concept of liquid do solid duality in semiconductor perovskites. We have the 2023 Nobel in Chemistry for quantum dots, which is a field I worked in for 20 years, where it, there is a meso scale in, interpolation between molecular level and bulk like. In perovskites, a new class of semiconductors, there is an interpolation between solid like phases and liquid like phases. In both cases, it's this interpolation between regimes that gives rise to interesting physics, chemistry, and properties that can hopefully be exploited for uh, future devices, as people in this department are probably more likely to do than I am as a, as a humble spectroscopist. So uh, I had made this entry talk uh, slide here uh, a few months ago when I gave my first lecture after a couple of years of not doing so. I had my five years ago talk and now this is my most recent version. And in the last five years there's been a lot of things happening in science and STEM all over the world about how we should run, how we should be funded, how we should live our lives. And as that happened, I thought, what can I offer to the undergrads in the hallway or as a scientist? So I had this posting outside my door saying that whatever we do, we should be thinking, debating, discussing, have free speech, have data. So I don't care if you agree with me or disagree with me, phase space is large. Let's find ways to discuss and debate intelligently as scientists and especially as citizen scientists, which is why I had that outside my hallway when I was depressed by human changes in the last five, 10 years about the ability to discuss topics, which is what I love as a scientist and a debater. So I got rid of that and things started to get better and perhaps I got sidetracked by science again. So I posted up what I love to post, which is my data. Uh, granted, this is unpublished data, but it's not going into science or nature. So I guess it's not gonna be embargoed. I'll send it to optic letters. What we show is femtosecond supercontinuum, which is what you use in a transient absorption spectrometer to measure, the, to create the probe light that you measure your spectrum. But we compared orange light versus blue light to drive the continuum and now we're playing along with that to do optics and whole sorts of fun. As Murad was saying, we do things spanning physical chemistry to condensed matter physics to optical science and a variety of other things as needed in order to do the science that we find interesting, which is spectroscopy of condensed phase materials. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the people who did the work. In the second row are the people who built the two-dimensional electronic spectrometer, which is part of what I'll talk about and is sort of my pride and joy for the last five or 10 years. Uh, and in particular, I wanna draw attention to Helene who developed the spectrometer along with Sam. Helene is now an assistant professor of physics in Berlin at Free University doing 2D spectroscopy and Sam is now interviewing for faculty positions. All of the perovskites that we studied were made by Dallas Strandell and the time resolved PL experiments were all done by Dallas Strandell. We have a variety of collaborators with whom we've been able to profit from, such as, in theory, Oleg Prejdo and Iran Rabani, and our newest samples are coming from Maxim Kovalenko, so we don't have to make samples anymore, which is nice because we get to do spectroscopy. So as we go on, I wanted to think about just general ideas of measurement. And if you think about general ideas of measurement, when I was a wee laddie graduate student, I made up the slide in 1998. So pardon the 1998 graphics. It was as good as I could do at the time when I was tinkering around with my PhD. On the left, we have a graph of complexity that I made up off the top of my head. And on the right, we have what I later off, I made up also off the top of my head, but later on, my supervisor told me, oh, that's the graph of everything. 
Well, the graph of everything is saying, well, we live in some space of energy, time, and, and, uh, uh, and so forth. We live in this volume here. We don't live in the astronomical volume here. We don't live in the atomic volume here. So we can't necessarily make sense of the microscopic details of liquid solid duality or quantum mechanics or, or spin. And we're not supposed to, as Feynman said. We want to be able to come up with ways of describing things theoretically, uh, but not to force our human uh, condition upon things. We look at measurements. So in quantum mechanics, as we're looking at quantum materials, the first decision in quantum mechanics happens for chemists versus physicists, which is do you work in position space or momentum space? On the left, we have position space wave functions with potential energy surfaces. On the right, we have momentum space wave functions with band structures. In molecules, we have potential energy surfaces because vibrations are very important for dressing the electronic levels. In bulk solids, we have dispersion of the electronic orbitals being more important than vibrations. What happens in a system that is mesoscale, like a quantum dot, that interpolates between bulk and atomic limits? Here are atomistic wave functions that were computed by a couple of our collaborators. And you can see that you have these wave functions of, ma of many body states in a mesoscale system. And it's not obvious in which world you reside. By the same time, that makes life fun, I would say, as a theoretician, as an experimentalist, that makes these a fun problem, mesoscale physics. The second decision in quantum mechanics and spectroscopy is do you work in the frequency domain or the time domain? And I've worked in both, and it depends on the situation. You do what is needed. In molecules, isolated molecules in the gas phase, they're often best represented in the frequency domain, whereas molecules in the condensed phase are often best measured in the time domain for a transform to give some sort of low frequency spectral density, but you can measure I of omega or C of T, either of which are formally related by Fourier relations. With those two introductions, we are now poised for a discussion about a new form of mesoscale material, which is the semiconductor perovskite, which is a material that is unlike historic semiconductors in that it is not covalent. It is uh, ionically bound, and rather than harmonic bonds, they have anharmonic bonds. Rather than being ordered, you have disorder that is time varying, so dynamic disorder as illustrated by this potential energy landscape. So these new materials are disordered in space and in time. That makes them complicated as a spectroscopist, and we aim to understand them, and we also aim to understand them because hopefully they'll be useful as, as we'll get to. The problem at hand for us as spectroscopists is to look at light absorption and light emission. When there's light absorption and light emission in a semiconductor, you generally think of the excitation as an electron hole pair, which is Coulomb correlated to produce an exciton. Here we have a single exciton, and in a quantum confined system, that single exciton will undergo splittings to produce fine structure. MeV level fine structure and 100 MeV level coarse structure in a quantum dot. If you absorb a second photon, you go into a double excitation called a bi exciton, which is energetically shifted with respect to twice the exciton energy by this binding energy. So we have single excitations, double excitations, multiple excitations. We want to understand these excitations, how they live and die in a material. In an atomic system, we have two level system. In a two-level system of a molecule, we dress the states by vibrations. And in a two-level system for semiconductors, we dress the states by dispersion. In each situation, you will have a different functional form for how the PL or emission line width changes with temperature. So we want to see how the emission and absorption changes with temperature and time and so forth. One of the problems that arises in these disordered, glassy, ionic semiconductors is that they're undergoing fluctuations in the lattice. When there are lattice fluctuations, there are energy gap fluctuations that we see like this with some distribution of energies, that's fine. But in the time domain, this fluctuating 
energy gap will give rise to an autocorrelation function with a characteristic time scale. This is how you describe fluctuations in liquid-like systems. That's going to be important later on. As well, you can look at radial distribution functions and say, I look more like a liquid or more like a solid. We're not doing that. As a humble experimentalist, I always think I want to observe things, and that's it. And uh, the way to observe things is ideally to have a better microscope than your neighbor. So we illustrate that idea with the STM at 4 Kelvin by Don Eigler in 94, where he was able to see the quantum corral of surface states and how wonderful that was, and that was a beautiful thing back in 94. But I'm not interested in a microscope, I'm interested in spectroscopy. So in spectroscopy, what we want to do is a few types of things where we can measure things with unprecedented resolution, whether in energy or time. In my case, it's time, not energy. So the first approach is time-resolved fluorescence or photoluminescence. And the key thing to show is that if you have a time-resolved emission spectrometer, you might use time-correlated single photon counting, which is a nanosecond resolution. If you're lucky, you have a street camera with 100 picosecond resolution, as we have here, so you can measure wavelength versus time, and you see a short-lived peak over here, which is unimportant. It's a multi-exciton. All that matters is it's short-lived, and we can barely resolve it with 100 picosecond resolution. We rebuilt our spectrometer from our hot rod friends in Montreal in a garage operation to go from, three, uh, from 100 picoseconds to 3 picoseconds, and now we very nicely resolve this high energy shoulder. So as you expect, when you have better resolution, you see new things. That's the whole objective of an experimentalist. If you build a better instrument, you get to see new things. The second experiment that we do is transient absorption spectrometer spectroscopy where we built our instrument as well. And that, I think most of us are familiar with the idea, but the objective is to measure an image of something frozen in time, whether a horse galloping, a bullet going through an apple, stroboscopically you want to capture an image with a shutter that is shorter than your motion. Well, if you wanted to create a femtosecond pulse, it turns out the shutter, if it were a physical shutter, would have to go at 10 to the 10 meters per second, faster than the speed of light. So you cannot use a physical shutter to make femtosecond pulses. What you can do is use the property of light. So inside a resonator, you have standing waves. If you take a spectrum of those standing waves, as shown here, different modes, they will interfere to produce a pulse, a train of pulses. So the more modes you have lasing inside your cavity, as long as they're in the proper phase relationship, you have what's called mode locking, which is how we create short pulses of light from a femtosecond laser. And there are other methods that we use downstream to create even shorter pulses of light. In a pump probe experiment, what we're trying to do is to say, here is an initial pump pulse that excites the sample. A time-varying probe pulse transmits through the sample, and you measure the change in transmittance or change in absorption. And you see a ground state bleaching here. You see an excited state absorption here. And that's the simplest idea of transient absorption spectroscopy, which is technically a four-wave mixing spectroscopy, but you don't have to understand it as four-wave mixing, you can just think of it as a pump photon and a probe photon at the photon level. What we did in our experiment is to do two pump probe experiments simultaneously, which was a trick we developed in 2005, so uh, that was a nicety that we developed in our home-built instrument. The third approach that we'll talk about is two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy or coherent multi-dimensional spectroscopy. In the case of 2D or CMDS, why are we motivated to do this new technique? All of spectroscopy so far has been one-dimensional. Here is a spectrum of absorption or emission where you see an inhomogeneously broadened band. You have red, green, blue sub peaks within the ensemble that are homogeneously broadened. 
What if you wanted to resolve the spectrum within that heterogeneous broadening? How could you do so? Or what if those sub ensembles were undergoing spectral diffusion within the heterogeneous ensemble? Could you resolve spectral diffusion? Could you resolve energy relaxation? And the answer is if you, if you flew overhead in the helicopter, you have an excitation axis here, you have a detection axis here, and you can see a two-dimensional spectrum that might be a stretched Gaussian, a skewed Gaussian, a round Gaussian. All of those shapes arise from the specifics of the line broadening phenomena that can be extracted. And in two-dimensional spectroscopy, you can see relaxation from a higher lying state to a lower lying state. And that's a process which is much cleaner to observe because 2D spectroscopy resolves peaks and resolves dynamics that were previously obscured by one-dimensional transient absorption spectroscopy. The way to do 2D spectroscopy is very complicated, but one can do it now as a result of 20 years worth of work. The difference is it's a coherence experiment, so we don't think in terms of a photon in and a photon out, like in pump probe. You have to think in terms of fields and a four-wave mixing experiment where the fields are phase coherent. One, two, three fields come in, creating a third order response that radiates and gets Fourier transformed and it turns into the two-dimensional spectrum. So the key point is the third field is the probe field, which is spent to a spectrometer and gets the detection axis just like in TA. How do you get the excitation axis? The excitation axis comes in from a pump pulse, which is an electric field, a second pump pulse, an electric field, which are phase coherent. And by maintaining the phase coherent time delay and Fourier transforming it, you get the excitation spectrum. So now you get an excitation spectrum and the detection spectrum, which is, which is something you're unable to do in 1D spectroscopy. Now, without all the details, I would show this to Jeff Davis's group, but uh, they already know this as well. The idea is in 2D spectroscopy, it's a coherent process, so you have to think in terms of field matter interactions, individually moving bras and cats populations and coherences, which enables you to see all sorts of new things. So I'm not going to belabor that and give you the results as we move along our happy way. I am happy to show you the picture of our spectrometer as we see on the right and on the left we see a schematic where our spectrometer uses non-classical optics, which is to say classical optics you can use to make a TA spectrometer like beam splitters and mirrors and prisms. Here we use a hollow core fiber which is our laser like light source generating white light over here. We use acousto-optic modulators to generate phase coherent pulse trains and send everything to a spectrometer to read out. So we have two non-classical optics that have replaced many classical optics. In the process, we could now get a 2D spectrum. And in fact, we can get a 2D spectrum that's a particularly nice one. So, uh, what I'm going to show you is a movie which was impossible 10 years ago, but now it's possible due to changes in technology. So in a 2D spectrum, what we're going to show is there's a peak that shows up over here. Wait, a second peak showed up. Now there's two peaks. There's a splitting. And watch the second peak relax down, 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 down. So the, so the first peak appeared. The second peak appeared later, which you would never see in a 1D experiment, and then we resolve the second peak relaxing to the same energy as the first peak. This is a two-dimensional electronic spectrum movie. Uh, admittedly, this is unpublished, but we have other ones that are published. And that illustrates how a 2D spectrum in principle looks and can reveal a variety of, uh, of uh, information. In our group, what we've been looking at historically are new materials for applications in energy, uh, uh, light emissive devices, and so forth, from cat selenide quantum dots to metal halide perovskites. 
uh, cat selenide quantum dots, we have the Nobel for it, and they exist in televisions and displays. So the, the physics is and the chemistry is reasonably well worked out. The new kid on the block are metal halide perovskites, which are a form of semiconductor that's been known for ages to the mineralogists, but it was rediscovered in 2009 by Japanese scientists who discovered that it worked very well for a photovoltaic. Between 2009 and 2015, there was a dramatic performance increase for reasons people didn't understand. So people started studying perovskites and the physics behind it. In 2015, people made nanoscale versions of perovskites, uh, nanocrystals, quantum dots, and now there are other forms of perovskites that are well made. The key point is that it's uh, this type of uh, 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 lattice like this, which is within, with, with a structure within a structure, octahedral cages, and these octahedral cages are very loose and anharmonic and rattling around. There are structural dynamics that are not taking place in silicon or cadmium selenide or gallium, gallium arsenide. Why are we studying perovskites? Why is the field studying perovskites in the last 10 years? Because of energy. They had shown tremendous promise for photovoltaics, now showing promise for LEDs and a variety of other things. That's perhaps the technical motivation. The scientific motivation for perovskites is liquid solid duality, where it was first proposed by Zhao Yang Zhu at Columbia that the uh, low frequency vibrational response of perovskites bears isomorphism to polar liquids in terms of the dielectric response. Here's water. Here's MAPI, methylonium, methylmonium lead iodide, a, a standard perovskite semiconductor. They both show a similar curvature that is not seen for gallium arsenide. So based upon terahertz experiments, dielectric experiments, a variety of experiments, it was suggested that the lattice is undergoing structural dynamics in a glassy form, which we'll discuss in time. So we've, prov we've done a review on this topic and so forth. And the idea is if you have a 15 nanometer cube as shown here, you inject a charge optically, you create a, an exciton as shown with the wave function, and the exciton is going to polarize the lattice, creating a polaron. That polaron is the lattice distortion about the central charge rather than a phonon. So to what extent does the polaron interact with the exciton in a manner that is liquid-like? We began our first experiments to look at things like energy relaxation and vibrations and so forth using transient absorption spectroscopy of cesium lead bromide perovskite nanocrystals, and we compared them to our favorite model system of cad selenide quantum dots. The main thing I want to draw attention to is the vibrational spectrum that we got from coherent phonon measurements. Here is cad selenide, which shows two very nice, well-resolved peaks, as you would expect for a covalent system that is harmonic. The perovskite shows a low frequency spectral density at 300 Kelvin, which is illustrated with an anharmonic system that's glassy and liquid-like. Now, one of the things that we saw is if you look at a TA spectrum, there's a bleach. You can look at how the bleach undergoes a red shift or a blue shift in time. Our impression was that the polaron would naively lower the energy of the system creating a redshift, and we should be able to see that redshift in time with TA spectroscopy. Life didn't work out like that. We saw the bleach blue shift in time in 300 femtoseconds. Cat selenide does nothing. Cat selenide's a rock. So what we found out is that the bleach actually blue shifts on the time scale of polaron formation, which made no sense until we started thinking about quantum confinement again. If the polaron interacts with an exciton and spatially confines it, this confined exciton polaron will give rise to an increase in the translational energy of the exciton a decrease in the potential energy of the exciton, and the total energy could be positive or negative, a blue shift or a red shift. So it takes a theoretician to compute, should the total polaron cause a blue shift or red shift, but we see an energy shift happens to be a blue shift, the time scale we can directly measure and say happens in 300 femtoseconds, and we believe that's the time scale of polaron formation about an exciton. 
that was TA spectroscopy and we can do more with 2D spectroscopy. So we had published a 2D experiment in Nature Communications in 2019 and built upon it more recently in this J Chem Phys in 2023. As in 2D spectroscopy, you want to look at three processes. Well, two processes. Spectral diffusion, which is illustrated by a anti-diagonal line width increasing in time. Exciton relaxation is a high energy state going to a low energy state. And in the perovskite, we might have diffusion and relaxation, which we can measure using 2D spectroscopy. So here we show the 2D spectra of two perovskites, one is cesium lead iodide, one is cesium lead bromide. The importance is, the difference is unimportant. What matters is you see two peaks along the diagonal and the upper peak relaxes. If you look at the two peaks, you'd say, ah, I see two peaks in the 2D spectrum given by the red and the blue here, but I do not see them in the linear absorption spectrum. Here's the same for the bromide. So 2D spectroscopy from 2D NMR to IR to electronic reveals peaks that were previously hidden in 1D spectroscopy precisely as promised. Wonderful. But with 2D spectroscopy having resolved new peaks, we can see kinetics or dynamics or relaxation from one peak to another. So you can measure relaxation from this excited configuration to this ground configuration. You measure a time scale and it's some number and that's great. But that you can get with pump probe spectroscopy or TA spectroscopy. What can you do with 2D that's new? What you can do with 2D that's new is you get energy resolution. So imagine I said, I'm going to say at this energy, how fast does it take to cool? At this energy, at this energy, at this energy, because I have all this energy in my pump bandwidth, so I can say I have a cooling rate that's fast, gets faster, slower, 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 and bottleneck. So I have an energy resolved cooling spectrum, not just a number. So I get to see dynamics here. And we get to understand why this cooling dynamics has this strange functional form that's not just a straight line, it's not just a number, but it's a function with peaks and valleys. So we're talking to our collaborators and proposing theories. We have no understanding of this yet, but mine has to do with uh, density of states and the Fermi's golden rule picture. Another interesting thing with 2D spectroscopy, as we said, is you can measure diffusion, not just relaxation. Diffusion means spectral diffusion. The spectral diffusion is measured by the anti-diagonal line width over time. So if you measure the anti-diagonal line width over time, you see an exponential rise, whether for both samples, you see an exponential rise. When the, when the homogeneous line width undergoes a rise, that happens due to Brownian motion, spectral diffusion. That spectral diffusion is what you'd expect to see in a liquid or glass and not in a solid. In fact, the solid is cad selenide, which shows the anti-diagonal line width showing an AC-DC effect. The AC happens from wave packet motion of coherent phonons. The DC says my homogeneous line width is static. It's not moving. It's a flat line. So the perovskite goes from the ground state to the excited state, free energy surface, evolves diffusively, and then finds its minimum, like a liquid. The, the quantum dot undergoes coherent wave packet motion. So we have incoherent motion that's diffusive for the perovskite. We have coherent motion for the cad selenide, uh, which is different, the con which is the contrast. So thinking about coherence, we wanted to see other aspects of, of physics that we can see with 2D spectroscopy that we could not see with 1D spectroscopy, such as the possibility of finding coherent superpositions of states, whether vibronic coherences or more importantly, or more interestingly, electronic coherences between excitonic states. There has been a lot of discussion for coherence mapping, in particular in photosynthetic reaction centers, and having said that, where coherence might be important in photosynthesis, energy transfer, coherence might be important in entangled photons, coherence is absolutely important in quantum computing.
But as it turns out, in the initial ultrafast experiments, they were very hard to do and hard to interpret, and people underwent Robbie flopping between the existence and lack of existence of electronic coherence and biophysical systems, so it's a complicated thing. Well, life go goes along its happy way, and you find better ways of doing the experiment. So what we did is to say, you can see a 2D spectrum, you can pick a point here and say, how does the signal change with time? It oscillates, oscillates. Fourier transform, make a peak. So we see oscillations, but those oscillations are not at the oscillation frequency of a vibration, but they're exactly at the oscillation frequency of that peak splitting into a doublet. So that oscillation frequency creates an electronic wave packet, but there's a weird thing that's happening. How can you create an electronic wave packet when the levels are all fluctuating and dephasing within 50 femtoseconds? Well, it must be that the fluctuations are undergoing correlated motions versus uncorrelated motions. So we could think about the magic of how perovskites can protect the system from electronic decoherence and potentially maintain electronically coherent states for long periods of time. I won't belabor this, but uh, that's another idea. So moving on to the PL experiments, what we want to talk about are ultrafast PL measurements in which we look at the factors that give rise to line width as a function of time, temperature, carrier concentration, and whatnot. So the thing we want to focus on is this uh, figure here where we see the line width of PL versus temperature. We will do a steady state measurement of PL line width versus temperature, later on a time resolved measurement. The key observation is the data shows a classic Canadian hockey stick functional form or Australian asymmetric boomerang functional form. If I'm not mistaken from my childhood, you have the symmetric boomerangs and the asymmetric boomerangs, and this would be the asymmetric form, I think, which are more complex. I tried one, it was very difficult. So uh, we have this asymmetric functional form of the boomerang with a slope and an offset and possibly an upward curvature. So look at the slope and the offset. Here are a variety of cesium lead bromide nanocrystals this data is from our group in an ensemble measurement, slope, offset. This data is from a single particle measurements from another group, slope, offset, slope, offset. We always see this hockey stick shape and the slope and the offset we aim to understand and if we can understand it, then we can control it, ideally. As before, we want to do a better resolution experiment and all prior experiments have been done with a time resolution of 100 picoseconds. That's very important because if anything fast happens, faster happens in PL, you would miss it. So you want to be able to have the fastest resolution, but not too fast. You don't need femtosecond res resolution, but you need about three picoseconds resolution, one to three picosecond resolution to see all the salient PL kinetics and dynamics, which brings up this little uh, statement or uh, uh, op-ed that I wrote for JPCL uh, maybe a year or two ago on kinetics versus dynamics because I see in the literature people use both terms interchangeably and in some cases even in the same paper and in some cases even in the same paragraph which is just horrible writing. There are English writers would have had a cow about that one. But uh, kinetics matters versus dynamics matters because kinetics means you describe populations by a system of rate equations. Dynamics means you have a microscopic trajectory representing initial state going to final state where the overall survival probability might be non-exponential and you might see oscillations as we see in this classic Zawail paper that got him his Nobel, Nobel Prize in 98. So kinetics versus dynamics. We'll talk about both. We do both as time resolved spectroscopists. So in these perovskites and in general in quantum dots and nanocrystals, you can have excitons that emit and multi-excitons that emit. At low fluence, you see a single peak, a single peak of the exciton X. At high fluence, you see a time dependent spectral bandwidth where at early time you're going to say, oh, there's all these other peaks. What are all those other peaks? The blue peak is X. The green peak is double X. The red and the purple peaks are triple X. And then you would say, you've just done some silly curve fitting. This makes no sense. 
or it's preposterous, but we actually did a very careful global analysis over all fluences, over all times, to be able to say, here are the states that contribute. And what's important is there's not a continuum of states. It's not a Fermi-Dirac distribution of states, but there's state one, two, three, n equals one, two, three. And you can, in fact, see the behavior of n equals one, two, three by doing a fluence dependence experiment where you say, I have the time dependence of n equals one, n equals two, n equals three. So each higher multi-exciton has faster recombination kinetics, as is well known from quantum dot physics, due to multi-carrier Auger recombination. We can see the fluence dependence and that all works out as it does. And having done a careful analysis of observing multi-excitons, we can get at a physical observable that people care about, which are the binding energies, and that tell you how much the bandwidth shiftings are, how stable these multi-excitons are, and ultimately how they might survive and be deployed for lasers. LEDs at high carrier concentration, entangled photons. These are the reasons why we care about bi-excitons and tri-excitons, and we can resolve all of these binding energies now because we have better time resolution. We can see the tri-exciton relative to the bi-exciton, which was previously impossible. So this is our paper published where, I guess, ACS Nano earlier this year. And I will, um, I will actually only briefly allude to this point, which is in, I, I like to find artifacts because I'm a spectroscopist and that's what I do. I don't like to, I like to do the most careful experiment. And so in perovskites, it was said there was a hot carrier phonon bottleneck, a hot carrier cooling process as re revealed by TA experiments. And we did this experiment that showed the whole thing was an artifact, but I won't belabor that here. That was published in ACS Nano after much fighting this past year as well. A more interesting experiment is this, I find. Um, we are going to measure the PL spectra at two different temperatures. Here is the spectrum in time at 300 Kelvin same at 4 Kelvin. Everything goes faster at low temperature. Perovskites emit fast at low temperature for reasons that are not well understood, and we're going to get at that later. But in the middle, let's just look at the phenomenology, where you can say the line width is some number. Here's the line width versus time. On the left, we have at low fluence for a single exciton, and on the right, we have high fluence for a tri-exciton. The single exciton shows no change at 300 Kelvin, but it shows line narrowing at 4 Kelvin. So we immediately might think of some sort of fine structure process undergoing thermal relaxation at 4 Kelvin, where thermal equilibration takes place at 300 Kelvin. Fine. What happens at high fluence is more interesting. We see a, a bandwidth decrease as tri-exciton goes to bi-exciton, then the bi-exciton survives but actually increases the bandwidth, then recombines and decreases the bandwidth. Here at 4 Kelvin, you see the effect even more strongly where there's this non-monotonic functional form to the bandwidth trajectory. Decrease, increase, decrease. Very strange. How do we describe this bandwidth trajectory? So we come up with a simple electron phonon model, as we always do, with a displaced harmonic oscillator. The displaced harmonic oscillator model gives rise to electron phonon coupling and temperature dependence to line width. But how many oscillators do we have? How many electronic states do we have? In any model as an experimentalist, perhaps even as a theoretician, you want to have the simplest possible model that fits. Not overly complicated because that's trivial. So the simplest possible model is one excited state which fails to capture any of the physics that we see of our line width trajectories. So we were forced to introduce or invoke the existence of a higher lying fine structural state, non-equilibrium. So at initial configuration, you're in the red state. The red state goes to the blue state. The blue state goes to the black ground state. The temperature dependence arises because you have two states with different coupling to the lattice. So the strong coupling to the lattice that gives rise to a line width trajectory, and there's multiple states that gives rise to the total set of observed phenomena. Because temperature causes the line width to increase, you can, you can relate the spectral observable to temperature and say, oh my God, look at this. What is my temperature jump? I have a temperature jump of some 50 Kelvin due to the tri-exciton 
recombining to a bi-exciton, releasing one exciton worth of energy as heat. Then the bi-exciton recombines to a single exciton, releasing one exciton of energy as heat. So the tri-exciton impulse is 30 picoseconds. The bi-exciton impulse is 100 picoseconds. You have these heat pulses which create a trajectory of temperature rising and falling. Um, I'll show the last point here, which is about the very classic concept of light emission, radiative and non-radiative processes and everything, and how perovskites are very unique and magical. The behavior of every molecule we know is that the quantum yield becomes large at low temperature, and that happens not because the radiative rate constant changes, but because the non-radiative rate constant is temperature dependent and activated. We cannot describe that temperature dependence using a Jablonski diagram, but we can using a configuration coordinate diagram with a transition state. So this configuration coordinate diagram represents all of molecules. But as we noted, in perovskites, emission becomes faster Radiative emission becomes faster at low temperature for reasons that are not well understood but have been proposed to invoke the giant oscillator strength effect which arises when a localized wave function becomes more delocalized at low temperature, more coherent, more volume, and more oscillator strength. So that's illustrated in this cartoon here. The data we show, having done the experiment on cesium lead bromide perovskite nanocrystals, we measure the PL decay kinetics and find out that the non-radiative decay follows a perfectly Arrhenius functional form and life goes great and you're always happy when science, conventional science you reproduce with your new instrument. But the new instrument shows new physics for the radiative decay. The radiative decay shows an exponential rise in its rate constant. Exponential. First of all, it's not a flat line as a molecule is. It's a rise and we also get the functional form as exponential which is immediately suggestive of a quantum coherent process. We propose that quantum coherent process to our collaborator Oleg Prejdo who does ab initio molecular dynamics theory and he was able to perfectly reproduce the experimental results of non-radiative decay being activated and radiative decay being uh, exponentially accentuated at low temperature due to spatial uh, 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 um, evolution of the wave function. And uh, I think the last thing I wanted to point to just as a quick point is in kinetics versus dynamics, we said there's a difference. If you go fast enough in time, you can see when kinetics makes the transition into dynamics. With kinetics, you expect to see an exponential decay of a population. But with dynamics, you might see oscillations or you might even see a buildup, something that's non-exponential. And sure enough, if we look carefully at cesium lead bromide perovskites at very low fluence, you see a buildup in the PL followed by a nanosecond exponential decay. Why would you see a buildup in the PL that you do not see in laser dye, you do not see in cat's and eye quantum dots? You see a buildup, as we proposed, because the structural dynamics of this glassy disordered lattice move and the, and the system finds itself in a configuration of a higher oscillator strength after tens of picoseconds. There are structural dynamics from hundreds of femtoseconds in the Polaron formation time to tens of picoseconds due to strain modes. So these tens of picosecond modes give rise to large amplitude motions that enable the transition moment to become larger, which is a breakdown of the Condon approximation, a famous approximation in physical chemistry and spectroscopy. So with that, I will conclude without belaboring all the points, saying that we've done a variety of spectroscopic experiments from TA to 2D to PL, and they've all shown sort of interesting phenomena in perovskite nanocrystals. And we find that this is a magical and wonderful system that interpolates between liquid-like phases, solid-like phases, phonons, molecular vibrations, coherent, incoherent motion, a lot of fascinating physics, which also gives rise to great physical properties that can be exploited for 
light emissive devices, which really excites me. And in fact, one of the things we're doing now is trying to work on how to make a perovskite quantum dot laser. Uh, We'd worked on cat selenide for that and others have as well, but perovskites look even better for making lasers and LEDs than quantum dots did. So we're trying to work on that as well. So with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from the floor? Oh, sorry. Are there any questions from the floor? Um, I have one to get started. Um, okay, so. You contend that due to this solid liquid duality in, in perovskite 2, excites an, you create an exciton and then it forms a polaron. Yes. And then it will form, it will, it will undergo some sort of confinement right. so that you can. Exciton polaron. Okay. Now, what does that, where is the potential barrier coming from? And how does that look in terms of the lattice? Like what's actually changing? Yeah, I mean, I guess I wouldn't say that the. Um, there's a potential barrier or transition state for evolution from the initial structure to the final structure. My mental picture is what happens in a liquid, which is solvation dynamics, and I studied that in my mm -hmm. postdoc. And if you look at what I, I made a mention to a review article here, and that I uh, will draw attention to because it connects to uh, a variety of topics in physical chemistry and physics uh, here. So the idea is that in a disordered solid, the atoms will reorient about a charge distribution and that incoherent reorientation with a displacement that is not uh, coherent will give rise to a polaron, whereas a phonon is a coherent displacement. A phonon, the lattice modes go like this, and the polaron, the lattice modes just go inwards like this. Now, where else do you see lattice modes go inwards like this? If you take an electron and you excite it from something and you inject it into a cup of water, that electron will be solvated by the wa dipolar water molecules. So the water molecules will, pre will crea create a solvent cavity and take the electron, which would normally be a free particle, and absorb it all wavelengths and then have it absorb only at visible wavelengths with a, a visible spectrum due to bound states. So the extreme case is an individual electron injected into ice or water creating bound states. This is perhaps a much weaker version where I would think you just diffusively go towards a free energy minimum. Okay. All right. I'll, maybe we'll discuss a, a little bit on that uh, later on. Does anyone have any other questions from the floor? Yes. So for the two-dimensional uh, electronic um, spectroscopy, What's in the highest excitation energy you can go? Sorry? What's in the highest excitation energy you can go? That is the challenge. And all of 2D spectroscopy has been working at red wavelengths for technical reasons. And it was easier. And also because the 2D spectroscopy field had been largely led by people who were looking at photosynthetic reaction centers which absorb in the red. So that was 600 nanometers. We had to go to 500 nanometers where the perovskites are. So 450 to 550 nanometers roughly is our bandwidth right now. 450 to 550 nanometers approximately. And to do that, we had to make a new light source. So we made a new light source to go from the red to the blue. That was the first step. The second step is to get higher and higher bandwidth. So the bandwidth right now we have is 450 to 550 nanometers approximately on a good day. Uh, if we try harder, we can get more, but that's hard to function. It's very, very, very finicky and unstable. As, as an old ultra-fast person said, it was, it's not that hard to go to 100 femtoseconds, but to go from 100 to 10 is astronomically difficult. Right now, we're at about 10. And if you go from 10 to 5, it's ridiculously difficult. So, I mean, there's two groups in the world that can go at 5 femtoseconds. We're at 10. Okay, so I think we might uh, leave it there for time. But thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker again. Uh, if you'd like to meet with Pat, please just drop me an email and I can set up the time today.